So we discovered in our previous presentation that the Bible actually contains prophecies. And these prophecies we discovered had actually to do with the destiny of the United States of America. And while we will not necessarily go into the details as we did in our previous presentation, we saw that the Bible makes an amazing claim. And the amazing claim is that the alliance between church and state, the unity between church and state, will at, point, at one point or the other, they're going to come together. And it's going to cause, as we discovered, it's going to cause the earth that dwell therein to make an image of the beast and an image to the beast. And this would then make the people who are dwelling therein to worship whatever that thing may be. And the only thing and the only way uh, this could happen is that if the religious side of that country gets a, what should we call it, a revival, a powerful revival. Because as we understood, the atheistic left liberal side cannot make religious laws. Only the Christian right, only the religious right can make laws that has to do with worship. So I want to continue on and study it with you. And we discover that the leading churches of the United States they're going to unite upon such points of doctrines as are held by them in common. As they are uniting and as they have a united front and a united church, only then and then will they be able to take this big step towards the state. And let's see how it continues. Now this year, of course, in 2016, we had the U.S. elections. And already now, the evangelicals and the Christian right recognized that in order for us to win the U.S. election, we need to mobilize an army. And Mr. Lane, who we are going to come back at later on in our presentation, he said here at the bottom, if the Lord were to call 1,000 pastors in America, 1,000, and they ended up with average 300 volunteers per campaign in 2016, that would be 300,000 grassroots precinct level evangelical conservatives coming from the bottom up what is the word bottom up so obviously the change they say is not going to come from the top down but it's going to come from the bottom up in other words the people will decide what is going to happen what is not now this is significant because we are told in Revelation 13 that it is the people who are going to dictate that this is what we want. In Revelation 13, it is clear that this worship command is actually not a, coming from a top down, but it's a bottom up. Really interesting. And they say that as if that would happen, they say it would change America. Do you believe it would change America? I believe not only America, but it would change the entire world at the russia tv uh, russia today says that over half of republicans want to ignore bill of rights make christianity national religion this was in 2015 in february what is the bill of rights all about the bill of rights says congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion but they say ah, ah, let us ignore it because we want to have a christian country. We're going to come back to these principles here. And this is what has been, people have understood, Thomas Jefferson has said it, that um, it's the separation of church and state. And that is close to all of that. Now, as, as, as I said in the, in the afternoon presentation, that it was the religious right, or rather it was the Christian right, that was literally behind and supported Donald Trump for him to become the next president of the United States of America. That's significant. Because if Donald Trump would not have gotten the support from the Christian right, he would not be the president-elect today. Isn't that something? So there was something that Trump found with evangelicals. Trump found something with the Christians, which Hillary Clinton could not find. And so... 
up until now in 2016, many people have been thinking, even mass media, that, you know, the Christian right, the religious right, this is not something that we should focus on, we should not focus on that, because they are dead. And this is what this article says at the Christian Post, written by Tony Perkins, who, by the way, is a lovely guy. I believe that I'm not judging when I'm going to talk about these people who support him and what they are standing for. I'm not judging them. I'm not, who, who am I to judge? I don't see the heart. Only God sees the heart. And so when I see them defending Christianity on in mass media, whether it is Fox News, CNN, BBC, where they stand for biblical marriage, when they stand for life, pro-life, and all of these things, I salute them. I respect them. But the question is, will their political uh, support for a certain political candidate, is it going to go in a certain direction as we would have understood it? And that's what he says, that the religious right thought to be dead helped Trump win. And that's what, that's what I'm saying to people. You know, atheists, they say that religion is dead. I say, oh, no, no. You may think that religion is dead, but religion will play, especially Christianity, and its power will play a significant role. Now, evangelicals believe that the past eight years under the presidency of Barack Obama, of course, not every evangelical, but most evangelical leaders say that Obama has been for the past eight years been introducing anti-family, anti-faith policies. And so one of the reasons why they said we are going to support Trump is that according to them, Trump is behind evangelicals and that Trump is somehow going to support them as we are going to see. In this presentation, clips have been added from Christian leaders who have either openly supported the Trump campaign, the Trump administration, the Trump presidency, or just have been concerned about the future of Christianity in the United States. Now, the reason for these clips which have been added to the presentation is for the viewer to have an overview of the concern evangelical leaders had of an ultra-left, ultra-liberal, anti-conservative, anti-Christian Clinton presidency in the United States. Now, most of these clips are taken from a website called Right Wing Watch, which is a non-profit organization which seeks to expose the far right's extreme and intolerant agenda under Trump, which they now claim, the right wing watch, they claim has never been more important. When we added these clips to our presentation, the viewer must understand that we are not in any way supporting the vision of right wing watch and other liberal organizations that seek to relegate religion in general and Christianity in particular to the fringes of America and the Western world. We do not support a nihilistic, naturalistic, and atheistic view of the world and of society. Since we are Bible-believing Christians, any concern that may deal with the sanctity of life, marriage and family, the importance of religious rights, including the liberty of conscience, are things that we do take seriously, thus compassionately appreciating the worriness and actions of these Christian leaders. We truly appreciate it. We consent that the pillars of our contemporary Western society, being epistemological and moral relativism found in the notion of post-truth, are like a house that has been built on sand and our society is ready to crumble at any time. The fraction of our civilization and the innate brokenness of the individual needs healing. And we believe that Jesus Christ can deliver this healing touch to all who are willing to receive help. Therefore, the United States and Europe, and the world for that matter, is in desperate need of Jesus and of his healing touch, maybe more than ever before. With that said, we do not support a theocratic vision argued by the religious right, since, as it had been shown in the previous presentation, Revelation chapter 13 makes it clear that before the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be a false religious revival in the United States, where churches will unite upon an unbiblical foundation, 
leading to the amalgamation and unity of church and state where religious laws will be legislated with the view and the notion of getting the country back to God. In this sense, we are really thankful for Right Wing Watch for helping us in this presentation by having collected the different clips showing how Christian leaders view a coming Trump-Pence presidency. Watching these clips and the entire presentation from a prophetic perspective, this is truly enlightening and we believe that we are living in fascinating times. I understand that we have to win the hearts and minds of people into the kingdom of God, but once they're there, what do we do with them? They shouldn't still be conducting business the way they did before. That's a part of the cultural commission is that we need to train people, as Jesus said, teach them all things that I have taught you. And part of that is impacting the world around us with truth. We are about to be challenged to the very core of what it means to be a Christian. If the court hands down this decision, redefining marriage for America, they're not going to come and take you dragging and kicking and screaming out of your church in the next six months. You might have five years. Dr. Luther, you wrote about this in one of your recent books. You're preparing your church for persecution. This is a defining moment for our generation. And our people need leaders. Pastor, lead, and the people will follow. Amen. America is crying out for leaders. We see what happens when we don't elect and choose leaders. America is ailing. America is dying for the lack of leaders. Proclaiming that government has crossed the line may mean resisting and teaching our people to resist unrighteous and unlawful government. It's time to teach them. If we don't elect a bold, courageous, godly leader in this next election, I'm afraid we may not have another election for our republic. That's not hyperbole. That is the reality based upon what this president's policies have done to this nation. But what struck me was that on the eve of this Supreme Court decision on June the 26th, if you watched the news, you saw that the president had bathed the White House in the colors of the so-called gay pride. The parallel between the pride of Uzziah and the pride of our national leader in shaking his fist in the face of God was stark and alarming. I believe it is time that we see the spiritual leaders of this nation step forward, not simply to confront the corrupt civil authorities, but we must seek the face of God for our own silence, for our own advocation of our responsibility to this country and to this culture to be God's voice. See, I believe what has been missing in America and why our government has gone down this path is because the prophetic voice of the church has grown silent. Too many want to fit in and not offend and become politically correct. I want to be biblically correct. In the last 50 years, government has increasingly usurped the voice of the church on issues that are inherently religious, declaring matters of biblical morality, private concerns, or personal rights to be decided by the courts, secular, because the hearts of our leaders have become proud and lifted up. I cannot see a more clear visual representation of where our nation stands than on, than on Friday morning, our courts turned the sacred into the secular, and that night, the president bathing the White House in the colors of pride. God have mercy on America. It's time for the val men of valor to stand and say, you have crossed the line. Whether that is so or not, we will see. After all, Trump is also a politician. Don't forget it. So he may say something when it is the primaries and the general election, but the main issue is will he keep the promises? 
and fulfill them when he is in the presidency. That's the main issue here. So he may say a lot of things. So we need to be calm. We need to see this is what he said. Will he continue that later on? So if the media had questions about the influence of the religious right, they were answered early Wednesday morning. They are back, so to speak. And he says, in the end, though, what we witnessed wasn't just the revenge of the deplorables, but the collapse of the Obama legacy. After the spectacular failures of Obamacare, the demoralization of our military, the explosion of lawlessness, tolerance of corruption, and obsession with social engineering, Americans finally have the opportunity to listen, to rebuild the country they once knew. Isn't that interesting that you go and press to the other side as extreme as it can be? And what happens? The pendulum is swinging back. That's my question to you today, actually. Is the pendulum swinging back? Because evangelicals say, we had enough. We want to rebuild our country because we don't recognize America anymore. And I think many Christians can somehow recognize what they are saying. Because... As Christians, when we see lawlessness taking place, our hearts are, are deeply, we are deep feeling that as well. And so in a sense, we do agree with them. The question is, what is the solution? And maybe this is where we would differ with their solution. But the election, he says, is just the starting gun. Donald Trump may open the door to America's solution, but he wasn't never meant to be the solution. The true transformation of a society starts in the hearts and minds of men. And in a sense, we agree with that statement also. For transformation to occur, it needs to come from the heart. But according to them, as far as I'm concerned, is that you first need to have control, politically speaking. And when you have control politically, then transformation will occur. You see, we see the other way around. We start with the heart first. And if it may go into politics, that's another issue. But we look at the heart first. And listen to this, and under an administration, Trump, with no interest in continuing the eight-year war on the First Amendment, we may finally see what the church is capable of. What is the church capable of? The church is capable of many, many, many things, as we have seen during the, 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 during the history. And we are going to see what the First Amendment is and how it effect, effectively touches everything. Is it, is it perhaps true that Donald Trump will not only make America great again, but the church great again? And what does it mean that the church would be great again? These are some of the issues that we need to face and ask. And so, as I said, Trump's election means religious right is alive and well. The religious right is not dead. The religious right is living. And now with the four years of the presidency of uh, Donald Trump, they, believe me, they are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Religious right, according to New York Times, believes Donald Trump will deliver on his promises. Well, we'll see. Only history will be our judge. And we could go into all of these things, but what Trump was basically saying to conservative Christians during the general election was that he would be their last hope to protect them against the changing culture. And he says, this is your last chance. And evangelicals are realizing this and they say that, you know what? If we don't win this election, America is lost. So that's their mindset. We may perhaps laugh at it, but that's the mindset of the evangelical Christian, at least from a conservative background, who says, you know what? If Donald Trump doesn't win, we are lost. America is, is we will not be able to turn it around. And he said that, um, you know, Trump was doing all of these. He promises a lot of things. He included appointing a conservative to the Supreme Court. Um, it's in interesting that this coming administration, in either these four years or eight years, may appoint at least three or four judges or justices to the Supreme Court. Isn't that interesting? If you really want to go with a conservative agenda, you better have conservative justices and judges. If you want to go, go with a liberal agenda, go and pick liberal justices and judges. And so Trump says that, you know what, I'm going to pick people and judges who are conservatives 
and maybe even Catholics, as we will see soon. He's going to do all of these things. And there is this governor, Mike Pence. We're going to come to him soon. He is an evangelical with a record of legislating against abortion and same-sex marriage. And as a vice president, so Mike Pence is the vice president. Listen to this. This is how evangelicals feel now. The Christian leaders say they feel reassured they will have access to the White House and a seat at the table. So they feel that during the eight years they have been kind of set aside, but now with this new administration and with um, especially Mike Pence, they have a foot in, so to speak. So Catholics, uh, we don't need to go into this, but he, th these were some of the things. And American Christian leaders, they said, why are we tolerating Trump? Well, we only th we discovered it now. The why they tolerate Trump is because they say that Trump is our last chance. If we don't vote for him, America is lost. And so new GOP, the grand old party, the party of Jefferson, uh, the party of Abraham Lincoln platform aims to make the Christian right even more powerful. Isn't that fascinating? We want to make the Christian right more powerful. And Donald Trump, he is the defender of the faith. Trump calls on U.S. Christians to unite. But you know what? Trump not only called Christians to unite. Trump made a, not only, uh, in my understanding, a bizarre statement, but Trump made this statement. He says, if I'm president, Christianity will have power in the U.S. Now let that sink in for a second. What did he say? If I'm president, Christianity will have power in the United States. Can anyone see where we are going? Especially with our understanding of the previous presentation. Now, someone says, and especially a Christian viewer says, but Sebastian, do you say that it is wrong to have power? Is it, is it wrong for churches to have power? Of course it's not. It's, of course it's not bad for Christianity to have power. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that power can be abused. That's what I'm saying. And if you give someone or something too much power, you know that that's going to be even more abuse when it comes to that. And my question is, are minority denominations, minor denominations within Christianity, is he seeing that as part of Christianity? Or is he seeing Christianity as the major denominations? I'm speaking about the Catholic Church. I'm speaking about the Evangelicals. Maybe the Orthodox Church, and that's it. Do you, do you see where I'm going? How does he define Christianity? Anyone who worships on the Sabbath? It, could that person, could that denomination be part of his definition of Christianity? Because if not, obviously we are not part of the, of, of the thing. We are not sitting at the table. We cannot have our foot in at the White House, so to speak, as we discovered. But it, not only that they're going to get power... He says the power of our group, Christians, I mean together, if you add it up, it could be 240, 250 million. And yet we don't exert the power we should have. He says, what if we could just come together, right? What if we just could come together and, and decide what we should do? But you know, the fact is that there is nothing that politicians can do to you if you band together. Isn't that what is going to be what did we discover in Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14? That the two bridges, right, in order for the united church to come together, that we are seeing that. And when they have united, what did we discover? That when they are united, then they can go together to the state to implement the religious requirements that they want to have. Now, this is not um, something that I have come up with. We have consistently seen in the previous presentation and in this statement that this is actually the case. You have too much power. 
But the Christians don't use their power. We have to strengthen. Because we are getting, if you look, it's death by a million cuts. He says, if, if I tell you one thing, because if I'm elected, because if I'm there, you are going to have plenty of power. You don't need anybody else. You are going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. So evangelicals are seeing that, wait a minute, from Barack Obama, there is this anti-family, anti-faith policies that are taking place. We are getting checked to the side we, as we are not important. And here comes a guy who understands us. Here comes a guy who says that I am your last chance. And not only that, if I'm in office, you are going to have power. Is it not appealing? Is it not appealing? Of course it is appealing. But... It means that Christianity does not have any power today. If Trump says, I'm going to give you power, correct? Anybody remembers the origin of the beast and the origin of the image of the beast? Apostasy in the Christian church leads to the loss of power of the Holy Spirit. But they want to have power. So they're going to turn to the state. This statement, my friends, is prophetic. This statement, my friends, is prophetic. And I'm just, time will show us what that plenty of power really is. Now let us come to the Johnson Amendment. Now this is what TJ was telling me about, and I did my research. What is the Johnson Amendment? Well, if you want to, if you want to help uh, Wikipedia, you can help it. If you're not, you don't help it. But Johnson Amendment refers to a change in the U.S. tax code made in 1954, which prohibited certain tax-exempt organizations from endorsing and opposing political candidates. In other words, if you want to become an organization that is tax-exempt, it's called the Section 501c3. If you are going to become this, and mostly these organizations are religious in, in, in nature, says, okay, you, you can be there, you don't need to pay any, any taxes, but don't get involved in politics. That's what this thing is all about. And the, move, then the moment you get your hand and your fingers in politics, the government can say, okay, you're part of politics, fine, but we are going to remove the Johnson Amendment. And not, not remove the Johnson Amendment, but that you are not going to basically be um, exempted from taxes. And so this has meant that since the 50s, Christian churches have not necessarily been able to um, endorsing or opposing political parties and speak up on certain moral issues. And so in one sense, it is a positive step because you want to have separation of church and state. On the other hand, you also want Christian voice in society. But what happens if a Christian speaks up? Tax exempt or gone. And Donald Trump understood the second reason why evangelicals would um, vote for him. And I want to thank the evangelicals because without the evangelicals, I could not have won this nomination. I dominated with the evangelicals. A lot of people were surprised. They say he's not perfect. But you know what? They know I'm going to get the job done. They're really smart. And I said, and we call it the Johnson Amendment, where you are just absolutely shunned if you're evangelical, if you want to talk religion. You lose your tax-exempt status. We put into the platform, we're going to get rid of that horrible Johnson Amendment. One great, great gentleman that everybody knows, but whose name I will not reveal, said, Mr. Trump, we live in fear in our churches and our synagogues. We live in fear that we're going to lose our tax-exempt status if we say anything that's even slightly political. And I looked out the window, I was in Trump Tower, and I pointed to people walking down the street. I said, well, they have the right to speak, but you don't. That means they're more powerful than you are. We have to do something about it. How did it start? How did it start? Because of Lyndon Johnson, 
And he actually had a problem in Texas with a certain religious leader. And he did this and he got it done. And we're going to undo it so that religious leaders in this country and those unbelievable people, and not because they backed me in such large numbers, but so that religion can again have a voice because religion's voice has been taken away. And we're going to change that. Okay? Donald Trump has said that if elected president, he will abolish the Johnson Amendment, which prevents churches and other religious bodies from campaigning politically. He says, guys, not only am I going to have you plenty of power, I'm also going to remove the Johnson Amendment so that when time comes, you can campaign politically and oppose and endorse whoever candidate you seem to wish. This could be a really dangerous step. Introducing his Catholic running mate, Indiana Governor Mike Pence, in New York on Saturday night, the presumptive Republican candidate said, we are going to get rid of that horrible Johnson Amendment. And we are going to let evangelicals, we are going to let Christians and Jews and people of religion talk without being afraid to talk. Trump has excited evangelicals with the move, which comes amid a growing tilt for Christian vote, an appeal which so far at least appears to be succeeding, and he succeeded indeed. In these troubled times, uh, I believe we stand at a turning point. When those who cherish faith, uh, those who cherish freedom, those who cherish the sanctity of life and all the liberties enshrined in our Constitution should step forward and heed the call to action. Donald Trump will also sign into law legislation that will free up the voices of faith all across this country by repealing what's come to be known as the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment's literally been on the books since the 1950s, and it essentially threatens tax-exempt organizations and churches with losing their tax status if they speak out on important issues facing the nation from the pulpit. Donald Trump and I are both committed to work with re renewed Republican majorities in the House and the Senate to repeal the Johnson Amendment once and for all. He discovered the main point. He says, if we can get the Johnson Amendment out, which... He may do in this with his administration, he may not. But they want to have power. But the question is, where is that plenty of power going to lead them? He says that this is going to be my greatest contribution to Christianity. <laughs> By me reducing or taking away the Johnson Amendment. And so let us take a look at some of the who's who of Trump's tremendous. You know, he said tremendous. He says it all the time. So who is this tremendous faith advisors? And then after it, we're going to take a look at the political ideology that plays a crucial role for most of the people who are either his faith advisors or people high up in U.S. politics. Now, James Dobson, the people whom I'm going to basically uh, show you now, these are, these are the who's who in uh, Christian um, evangelical Christianity in the United States. You have James Dobson, who is the founder of Focus on the Family, and uh, he endorsed Cruz, but he said, you know what, I'm criticizing Obama, we need to have... This is our last chance. We need to do something. Hi, I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I know that many of you are deeply concerned, as I am, about the direction our country is headed. We're losing ground as a nation every day. And that's why I've decided, as a private individual, to endorse Donald J. Trump for President of the United States. I believe he and his running mate, Governor Mike Pence, will provide the leadership this nation so desperately needs. Most importantly, Mr. Trump has promised to nominate conservative justices to the United States Supreme Court. I hope you will join me in voting for Trump and Pence on November the 8th. Jerry Falwell, he is president of Liberty University. He was actually the earliest evangelical leader to endorse Trump. And so these are high up evangelicals who are in politics also. I think the country needs the same type of, uh, I think the country needs uh, a doctor who has the cure for America's ills. I think we're at a turning point. I think we could lose our country if we don't choose the right president this time. 
And I think Donald Trump is the man for this point in history. And I think you, you have to look past you, you can't be, we're not electing a pastor in chief, we're electing a, a commander in chief, and we, we can't expect our, our commander in chief to have the same qualities as our pastors. You have Richard Land, we are coming to him soon in a moment, and he said that, you know, we need to choose between the lesser of two evil mindset. We have Paula White, <laughs> right, that, Christ, that Christians are actually even saying that between the lesser of two evils. If it is evil, it is evil. Point. Period. Full stop. Next. Mr. Trump has been, um, I, should I say, pleasantly surprising, shockingly surprising. I wanted to hear you, what you had to say about that, yes. And in uh, terms of his nominees, of, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, some of my conservative friends and I, we've been pinching ourselves. Um, are we hallucinating or... Is this actually happening? Um, you know, this is the kind of, uh, of uh, these are the kind of people that would have been picked by Mike Pence. And, of course, Mike Pence is the head of the transition team. And I, I know a good number of the people on the transition team, and I can tell you right now, about half of them, Kirby, think I'm liberal. <laughs> I mean, these are very conservative people. And, um, you know, I, I've been asked, I've been solicited, five times now for personnel recommendations wow. or resumes. Um, now, i got to tell you, I don't hope this doesn't disillusion you, but that didn't happen in the Bush administration. <laughs> <laughs> no, they already sort of knew what they were going to do in some well, respects. They, yeah. Well, they would, they, would, they would take them, but yeah. they didn't solicit them. Yeah. Um, yes. this is, it, yeah, it, they sort of said, we know what we're doing, so, you know, we'll get your advice, but we already have a pretty good idea of what we're doing. And Donald Trump's kind of a newbie, and in that respect, uh, there I've heard uh, Tony Perkins say the same thing, Gary Bauer say the same thing, and now you, Richard Land, saying, uh, I'm just amazed we are being asked our opinions in ways that never existed, probably even in the Reagan no. administration, but certainly not no. uh, in the Bush administration. Not not in the Reagan or Bush 1 or, or Bush 45. Um, of 43. I also think it's important um, to note that um, yeah, I can't tell you everything I know here, but oh. I can tell you this. Um, this this administration is going to have more um, conservative Christians, uh, Catholic and evangelical in it, um, than any administration that I've been associated with or had contact with. And I've been doing this since Reagan. Um, this uh, personnel is policy, and 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 you know I, I don't really know what to say, it, Kirby. People that you and I would be very comfortable with are being put in place at every level. Paula White. Now these are the faith advisors for Donald Trump. Paula White is a Florida preacher and is a tele evangelist. But not only that, she is a so-called prosperity gospel preacher. You know what prosperity gospel is? It is the notion that if you believe in God, God is going to bless you. You know how they speak. God is going to bless you. And God is going to heal you. And He's going to make you rich. And He's going to make you famous. And all of these um, lies, which they actually are. And so, interestingly, that even conservative Christians reacted that Paula White, who is Trump religious advisor, is a heretic. So even some conscious Christian conservatives still exist today who say, you know, how can she be part of this all? Kenneth Copeland, very interesting. You know who Kenneth Copeland is? Kenneth Copeland was one of the, and is still, one of the um, faith advisors for Donald Trump. Now you now you recognize who the person is, some of you by picture. And he was the person who invited Tony uh, Palmer to his church to give the message of the protest is over, let us come together, let us unite. And Tony Palmer was the one who, who, who had a message from Pope Francis himself. And not only that, <clears throat> Kenneth Copeland says, that he has a he's in direct line with God. I don't know how, but he has a direct line with God, 
And because he's in a direct line with God, he can deliver messages from God to President Trump. You've been a part of the Faith Advisory <coughs> Council that was assembled together. Um, James Robinson had a part in that. A number of ministers, nationally known ministers, have been a part of that. What would you say that would be most interest to our Christian audience, especially the faith audience, that you've heard in those meetings, those phone calls, uh, that <coughs> gives you the most hope and what you're listening for what was your ear tuned to that you've heard out of that that was the most encouraging thing as a christian terry i believe the thing that <clears throat> excuse me um not is not so much what was said in the conversations in those meetings but the fact that we were having them hmm. mm -hmm. and yeah. i yeah. have no doubt at this point <laughs> From what I've what I've heard, what I've seen uh, that's taken place uh, the, over the last month that, that this has been happening, um, if something were to really, really strike my heart, if God really showed me something that I <coughs> felt like, and, and that the Lord would say, "You deliver this," yeah, yeah. I have no doubt but what I could deliver it. <laughs> And that was not true in presidents past, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though we had influence in in uh, in in some areas in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. But if the Lord were to say something to me in the other presidents that what little I've had to do with them, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know whether it could have ever gotten anybody to listen to me or not. But I am totally convinced that if the Lord were to say something to me, if mm -hmm. the Lord were to say mm -hmm. something to David, or if the Lord were to say something to Bishop that, that, that the president needs to hear, <clears throat> I have yeah. no doubt yeah. that we could do it and do it quickly. Yes, sir. And have audience to say, thus saith the Lord, and, and he wouldn't just turn it over to an aide or something and just write it off. He would listen and, and it would mean something. I cannot believe, I refuse to believe that God would give birth to this nation to see the devil destroy it. I refuse to believe that, and I will not believe that. I will stand against that. I will pray against that, and I will work against that with every fiber of my being as long as I'm on this planet. That this is going to be a quick recovery, and, and that we're right on the doorstep of the greatest rebirth this place has ever known. But if it's one night or if it's for the rest of my life, I'll not change. I will not believe that we'll bow our knee at the most important place in, in, in history's history. <laughs> This is it. This is it. And we're in it. Glory to God. This, it's one thing. James, I, I was saying about when I, I walked in here tonight and, and I, I see all this firepower. Glory to God. Hey, it, it's one thing to win the first game of the season. But this is Super Bowl, brother. And we're going to take it. And we're going to take it hard, and we're going to take it strong with overwhelming faith and spiritual force. I believe it with every fiber of my existence. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. We are in the midst right now of the new birth of this nation. Yes, we are. We are in that time of the Word of God that was delivered in November of 2014. There is a new birth for America. There is a new birth for this nation. We had, at the time, we did not know what it looks like, but we are seeing what it looks right right now. We are seeing that awakening. We are seeing a sweeping of the moving, the move of the Spirit of, of God from coast to coast all over this nation. Father, we thank you for all that you are doing in the midst of it, and thank you that we are being swept up in the glory of God over this nation. Things that have been lost are being restored. There's a new birth. 
right now for America and it's taking place right before our eyes and we will not set apart our responsibility and our duty to do Amen. what God has called us to do we say yes Lord yes we will do exactly what you've called us to do and we receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit Hallelujah. the outpouring of the Holy Spirit over Washington DC we see we see Congress praying we see them seeking God we see prayer coming back into our schools we see the Bible coming back into our schools we see abortion being turned around we see this nation being completely restored completely delivered for it is a time of the new birth of our nation and we're seeing it right before our eyes now in Jesus name we can laugh at it we can look at it from a skeptical eye from an atheistic mindset and say oh this is ludicrous but friends these are in charge now and what if they say you know let us have whatever message Sunday law or whatever why not he says Comp Copeland rejoiced that as a member of Donald Trump's faith advisory council he will now have direct access to the president of the United States for the first time in his life Copeland, who believes that he can cure Ebola by speaking in tongues, <laughs> rejoiced that if God puts something on his heart that needs to deliver to the president, he will now have a direct line to deliver that message. He says, I have no doubt that if something were to really strike my heart, if God really showed me something that I felt like and that the Lord would say, you deliver this, I have no doubt that I could say it to the president. Mm -hmm. These are the people who are advisors to Donald Trump. And these are the who's who's of evangelical Christianity. Now you remember in 2014, Kenneth Copeland and the evangelicals visited Pope Francis in Vatican. He didn't know how we were going to respond to it. And Tony said when he played that back to him, that he said he just... He just leaned back in his chair and began to praise God and began to worship the Lord and worship the Lord. And he said, they have to come see me. They have to come see me. Amen. They had to come see me. Praise God. And so the, the plan began for us to be there on the 24th of June. And so we just got back. Amen. Now, I'll, I'll, uh, let me show you a couple of, of things right here. Now, hold, hold that right there. That's, um, you recognize James and Betty Robinson there next to Tony. I'll just give you some goodies now. <laughs> um, and then I've got, some, I've got some other pictures I want to show you. A papal visit is 15 minutes. Now, somebody like the queen, the queen got 30 minutes. He set us up an hour and he had a previous appointment for another hour. So he had to go do that. And while he was doing that, they gave us a special tour of the Basilica, St. Peter's, coming in from his quarters. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice. Anyway, <laughs> and then we had a two hour lunch together. Folks, we got a Pope that's a real deal. And he is praying for Pope Francis. Could it be that one message that, Do that Copeland would say to Donald Trump, you know what, why not let Christians unite? And, why and as we are uniting, at least you said that if we would unite, you would listen to us. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. Then listen to our religious requirements. Do you see where we are headed? I think we are on a very interesting 
ground. We have Mark Burns, a South Carolina pastor. He's a very famous pastor, James Robinson, founder of Life Outreach International. He was politically active in the 1980s and then went into ministry. Now Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pastor James Robinson. Greetings in the name of the Lord. The first time I spoke with Mr. Trump, I said only God and we the people together with God's wisdom can make America great again. And Donald Trump says he's going to inspire us and lead us to do just that. From the time I began meeting with him back in April, I have never been received so graciously with such humility, with such sincere interest in the things that God has to say about freedom and about life. Jesus said to his disciples, if they receive you, they receive me. Now you work through the theology of that, but I want you to know this man has received me openly. I have never wavered. I proclaim the word of God. I held this Bible up with Ronald Reagan standing behind me, 17,000 church leaders. And I said, America, commit yourself not to politicians or political parties, but to the principles in this book that made America great and will be forever the land of the free and the home of the brave. And Ronald Reagan, listen to this, Ronald Reagan in great humility and gratitude walked up and said, I know this is a nonpartisan meeting. You cannot endorse me, but I only said that because I want you to know I endorse you and what you stand for. And Ronald Reagan saved freedom and gave it another day. We will lose freedom if we don't make the right decision in November. And it has to be for a return to freedom. I Here's the thing. The people in a nation like ours, this, this thing that I say as a Christian, in a, a democracy where the majority rules and where we're the ones who choose, then those we choose reflect the heart, conscience, and convictions of those who vote or who don't vote. Too many Christians have checked out. You've been told it's politically incorrect for church people to be involved. That is one of the biggest lies that ever came sure. through the lips of Satan. Do not believe it. Of all people on this earth that ought to stand up and protect the precious and be light to illuminate the way out of this present and pressing darkness, we're the ones to do it. If we ever come together, the gates of hell will tremble. And that's precisely what they're to do. I believe the government should fear the people. The people don't fear the government. And they've got to listen to us. Hey, hey, government, we can take control. There's only 500 of you. We can get rid of a whole bunch in one smooth swoop. And we can really reroute the whole ship. Listen to me. It's not too late. Later than you think, but it isn't too late. If we wake up, I want to tell you something. Hearing somebody like me and Todd sitting here and this sweet little girl sitting here by us, do you know who's trembling? All hell's trembling. The gates of hell tremble. The very fact that people who love God and know God and love their neighbor would ever stand up, speak up, and become a shining city set on a hill, oh, the demons shut up. I want to welcome you to life today. Ravi Zacharias is here. We have got 70 major church leaders and Christian leaders in the country here. Are you glad to be here meeting together? And we're meeting, we're meeting together because we love you. And because you matter to God, you matter to us. And we believe freedom matters. After all, it's for freedom. Christ set us free. So we're going to be hearing from these leaders. And I just wanted you to know that we're so glad to be able to share this time with you. You know, if you know the leaders that were gathered right here in this studio, I mean, yesterday and uh, into the evening, and you understand the great diversity in these various uh, denominational groups and the high influence and impact they have. And oftentimes they, they've been seen to be miles apart. And suddenly what Jesus prayed for, that his disciples, his family, would actually be one with the Father, but also with one another, like a family, the unity he prayed for. And it's this unity that's going to be essential to see America restored to stability and security that our hearts long for, to have the peace that we want, the protection that we want, the opportunity that we want. But we're facing some very critical decisions, and the only way we're going to make the right decisions and then see the people that are chosen by the people have the counsel essential to move us in the right direction that is beneficial to everyone. Now, James Robinson is there. He was also one of the crew, one of the members, one of the team who visited Donald Trump. Isn't that fascinating? So you have one advisor, 
The other one had Donald Trump, the most powerful person on this planet. Ronnie Floyd. This is a person to have your mind. He was the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to come back to Ronnie Floyd in a second with a picture that you are going to put this uh, picture, his face, and remember him and see if you will recognize him or not. Therefore, flowing out of that will be this conviction that we need to be involved in our country. We need to practice citizenship. But we also need to be concerned about those issues of life and uh, those issues that I talked about, uh, such as the dignity of human life. Uh, you know, what I have found also in this element of the Supreme Court justices mm -hmm. is that presidents at times, presidents can, can alter or shape or at least influence a generation, but their appointments can literally shape and influence yes, generations. Yes, Very and much. that is extremely important in the heart of evangelicals. Yes. And that's going to be really hard for anyone to ignore uh, because we cannot continue in the path we're going in this country. Very well put. All right, Ronnie Floyd, thank you so much for joining us. A lot at stake, no doubt, but thank you again for joining us. But he is pastoring and he is doing that. Robert Jeffries, he is speaking a lot about. Uh, moral issues on Fox News and on different um, news channels and is mostly defending Christianity, mostly defending the biblical notion of marriage and pro-life and abortion and many of these things for whom I'm, I'm, I'm really, really respecting. So when we are speaking about these people, we are not judging them, as I said. We are not judging them. But if they only would understand prophecy, and if they only would understand where they are headed with this unity movement, then maybe they would think. And I want to be very clear about this. Regardless of what happened Friday, the First Baptist Church of Dallas is not going to be intimidated. We are not going to be silenced by the liberal left, Barack Obama, or the United States Supreme Court. We are going to continue sharing the love and truth of Jesus Christ. David Jeremiah, another very interesting author, pastor, and tele evangelist. You know, uh, sometimes I think that uh, our standards are so high for who we want to get elected that if we don't make those standards, we think we've, uh, we've lost. I'm not really sure I can get somebody who's like me. I'm not even sure I can get somebody who's for me, but I'm pretty sure I can get somebody who's not against me. We have to get to the polls and get somebody who won't be against us. Make the pledge to vote. Visit MyFaithVotes.com. Jack Graham, one of, once again, a very powerful pastor. He is with Ralph Reed. We are coming to Ralph Reed in a moment. James McDonald, Chicago mega church pastor. So here, these are the mega churches and the pastors and the leaders who are advising Donald Trump on certain issues. We have Michel Bachmann, who is, was a Republican politician and in 2012 was also a presidential candidate. And you know, she's a Lutheran. And when it came out that she was a Lutheran and that she was going to run for presidency, one of the ways that the liberal mass media attacked her for was that her church considered the Catholic papacy to be the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That was the message that they countered her. And you know what? What she said? I don't believe that. She, she doubled down and she said, no, 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 no. I, uh, I don't believe in it. Very interesting um, skills that they are using. And here it is, a graphic. The night isn't even over. The decision hasn't even been fully made yet about the presidency. And already we know that the glory goes to the God Almighty, the God of the universe, the sovereign Lord. He is the one who did this for us. He did because his people got on their knees and cried out to Holy God and said, we can't go down this road anymore. Father, we ask you for your mercy. And this is the proof positive of what the Lord did. The Lord did this. The largest voting bloc in the United States are the believers. The faith community is the largest voting bloc. And what is amazing to think is that the choice is in our hands. 
we get to make the decision about whether or not we will have leadership. We're unlike other nations in that we get to choose who our leaders will be. And will those leaders reflect the values, the biblical moral values that we know are truth? Or will we choose to allow truth to be poured out in the street? Because there is a certainty that will follow. Either one of these choices, a certainty will follow. And that's why I think that's what we need to remember. It is urgent. We won't have necessarily this option four years from now, eight years from now, 12 years from now. But we have an opportunity right now. And I know that I'm dedicated every single day until the day of the election to speak truth anywhere that I can speak truth. And also to share from one who was on the front line in Washington, D.C., the urgency of what's at stake. So we've got to get our act together fast and in a way that's going to glorify a holy God. You would embrace competition would. with both arms and you'd want a biblical basis for your society just like the pilgrims through their example gave us that they embraced for us just like George Washington and the founders when they dedicated this nation to God at the inauguration the very first seconds of life of this country. I want to go into the chamber where you serve because in, in your the chamber House of Representatives, House of Representatives Washington D.C. in the, the U.S. Capitol. 23 lawgivers are, are honored because that is the place where the law comes out of the house. So you have 23 lawgivers and they're all side profile views except for one and that's Moses. And can I just say I have literally had tears come to my eyes. I've given speeches on this on the house floor. I stand in that chamber surrounded by the greatest lawgivers yeah. in history. Uh, Solon, Suleiman, uh, Justinian, uh, Innocent III, Hammurabi, all of the lawgivers of history, Grocious. like you said, in their side profile. But above the main double doors, the doors that the President of the United States enters when he's going to give the State of the Union address, that door is the door above that has a full-on, full-face view of only one lawgiver, and that's of Moses. And as we know, a holy God gave to Moses the moral law, mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments, the law upon which every other law yeah. has descended, and upon which no other law, if it violates that moral law, could stand, yeah. because that is the ultimate law. How interesting, the face of Moses looks down upon the Speaker of the House. That's right. The speaker stands at the dais and looks up at Moses. So too, the President of the United States, when he delivers his address to the nation and to the members of Congress and the Supreme Court and the ambassadors and all the heads of state, this is a very important moment in the United States when our President does that. He looks directly, directly into Moses. the face of Moses. Because we understand in this country that we are a nation of laws, not men. But when you become secular, you ignore jurisdictions. Those jurisdictions given by the lawgiver of the Bible, given by Moses through God. And, and it's and it's so sad this thing because right it here, degrades us it does. as a nation. It degrades our liberties and it degrades the greatness of a nation. And that's what God understood from Old Testament times. The greatness of a nation is built up by his law. Right. Yours is a walk which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of people to keep alive their sense of unity by means of just legislation. On the other, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God and thus to the transcendent dignity of the human being. <laughs> Moses provides us with a good synthesis of a walk. You are asked to protect by means of the law, the image and likeness fashioned by God 
on every human life. Today, I would like not only to address you, but through you, the entire people of the United States. Here's Ralph Reed. He is also an advisor to Donald Trump, a faith advisor. He is the founder of Faith and Freedom Coalition. And uh, he, he was on Times, and so the right, right hand of God. He was 33 years old, and his Christian coalition is on a crusade to take over U.S. politics, and it's working. And this was the 90s, right? Communism was gone, and the 90s is coming. The Christian right is coming up, and they are saying, if we want to save America, we need to get back to God, and we need to legislate, and we need to do all of these certain different issues and it seems that the Christian right and the religious right is dying. <laughs> but with Donald Trump, the Christian right is back in the game. Not only back in the game, but they are there. And I'll tell you another reason why it's going on, and this is not particularized to the church per se, Glenn, but another reason why is because we've had our own war on faith being waged here in America, not obviously with bombs or bullets or tear gas, uh, but, but rather with court rulings and executive orders and laws that seek to marginalize the role of faith in our own society. Well, hobby, so if people hobby, are sitting hobby. around wondering, why aren't we doing more? It's because we've been callous about it in our own midst. Uh, Hobby Lobby is, is a great example. I really believe this with all my heart. Whatever problems we have as a nation, God is bigger than every one of them. And whatever problems we have, and I think this has probably always been true, but I think the Lord has brought us to this place so that we all realize it, and it's irrefutable. Look, we're going to turn out a big vote in November, and believe you me, change is coming. The Calvary is on its way. But what ails America? is not going to be solved by throwing out one group of politicians and replacing them with another. And it's not going to be solved by repealing their bad laws and replacing them with other laws. Now, those are important things, but there is only one thing, only one thing, that will bring this nation back to economic, military, and moral greatness. And that is, we need an awakening, a moral and spiritual awakening that will call our nation back to brokenness, humility, reliance, and dependence upon Almighty God. What we need is a change in the moral and spiritual sentiment of the people that can only be accomplished through a move of the Holy Spirit that will yeah. bring about a great awakening. A.B. Bernard, pastor of New York's biggest... Men. See, these are powerful leaders in evangelical Christianity whom have direct access to the President of the United States. Robert Morris. Now, did I remember the other guy's face and the picture? So you have Robert Morris. He's an author and, once again, a mega church pastor. And I wonder, where else, when I was doing my research, I said... His face and another man's face, it's so familiar, as if I, not as if, if I would have met them, but it, it is like I have seen them. Recognize him? Recognize him? Yes. Recognize him? Yes. James Robinson. Mm -hmm. Remember when we were talking about the gathering this afternoon? That the gathering was this event to unite the body of Christ together. And that the church, according to them, should become the conscience of the government. Remember when we studied that? These people who are saying, and remember when they had the motto, uh, one voice, one, um, one vision, one agenda. One voice, one vision, one agenda. Now, these people who say that the church should be the conscience of the government, him, him, and obviously everyone else, but him also, 
are faith advisors to the most powerful leader, political leader on this planet, Donald Trump. <clears throat> Could you see an image of the beast coming together? Could you see an image of the beast, an alliance of church and state coming together to worship folks to go against their own conscience? I see it before my eyes. I don't necessarily say that it is going to happen in the next four years. I am not necessarily saying that it is going to happen in the next eight years. It could happen and I would be happy because Jesus would come. But it could be that now only the foundation is being laid for it to happen later on. But these steps, friends, this is, I believe, prophetic. And if we don't recognize it, I think we are spiritually blind, to be honest. This is prophetic of enormous significance. And many people, at least on the left liberal side, they recognize the threat, but they don't see where it is going to lead. We understand it, and we should tell them, hey, have you considered that prophecy says such and such and such? Not only are the left liberals, but even the right conservatives, as we saw just a second ago, are concerned themselves. So friends, now is the time to preach the message. Now is the preach the end time message of ours because it has never been as relevant as it is now. It is powerful, let me tell you that. An interesting symbolism, by the way. I'm not going to go into it, but the light is almost at the top. We are living today in similar days like the days of Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel's agenda once again desires, in a de facto manner, desires to silence the oracles of righteousness and justice. Many in that spirit and vein of Jezebel have declared the end of Bible-believing Christianity in America. In other words, the spirit of Jezebel is alive in 2016. So here we are today, and many have declared the end of Bible-believing Christianity in America. And Jezebel has declared that, that, that American Christianity will come to an end. But just like Elijah, we as a body, we as a movement, we as the bride, we as the ecclesia will not die. Why? We are the church of Jesus Christ. And listen, Jezebel, listen, Ahab, the gates of hell cannot, the gates of hell shall not, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We gather tonight by faith and declare that the next generation in America will not be lost. I believe we're going to see a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this nation that there is a double portion mantle about to descend upon the next generation that will usher in an awakening like we have never seen before in the history of America, a new Jesus movement. And Trump faith advisor said that Donald Trump is on God's side. He's on God's side and therefore he is going to win. And Perry, that would be the summation of it. I believe that what we saw was God answering the prayer of his people and giving us a window not necessarily a long window, but I think giving us a window of opportunity that now really more than ever depends on the what God's people do following what we saw happen on Tuesday. Who are out helping Christians to run for office and getting behind those Christians, financing them, and then working for them uh, to get them elected. Because if we don't, we're going to lose this country. This is probably the most important election in my lifetime. I'm 64 years old. Well, Frank, and uh, we're, we're on the precipice of losing the United States of America, and we'd better get out there and vote that 38 million. Listen, b both of these candidates are flawed, both of them. Uh, but we're not voting for our pastor. We're voting for somebody who's going to be appointed the next Supreme Court justices. This election is not about Hi Hillary's lost emails, and it's not about uh, Donald Trump's uh, potty mouth. This election is about the Supreme Court. This is the most important election of our lifetime. We have a chance to get pro-life judges for the right you know, which could change this country uh, we have uh, an opportunity to to have leadership that's going to protect Christians uh, this is huge not only has Donald Trump reached out to the evangelicals Trump has also reached out to the Catholics so he has also 34 members to Council of Catholic advisors 
So he has counsel from the evangelicals and even from the Catholics. Brick Santorum, ambassadors, powerful people who have been ambassadors, but also Catholic, advising him. Donald Trump, as I said, he was holding a speech at this dinner where also Hillary Clinton participated at. And we saw the, the, the picture with the archbishop, you remember? We're standing at the next side and laughing. Now this is the speech. And I want you to pay close attention to how he ended his speech. Listen to this. It's fascinating. He said that, and that we together broke all time record tonight is really something special. More than six million net, 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 net. The cardinal told me that's net, net, Donald, remember. Now listen to this. We can also agree on the need to stand up to anti-Catholic bias. Mm. Let that sink in. Mm. We agree upon standing up against anti-Catholic bias. So obviously, his Christianity that he has envisioned which he wants to give a plenty of power, does not belong to the anti-Catholic group. I wonder who may be an anti-Catholic. Could a message like this, which we have studied and which I have preached today to you, could a message like this today in our post-modern, post-Christian, post-post-post-whatever age that we are living in, could it be deemed as anti-Catholic? I think it could. Very interesting. But not only that it sees anti-Catholic bias, and sure, we are not talking about people here. Any person who is attacked for his faith, we should stand up for that person. So this is not what I'm arguing. I'm arguing if I would say something about the system, would I be still considered as someone who is an anti-Catholic bigot? And the answer is yes. Because it seems to be that we cannot um, differentiate between a person and a system, unfortunately. We can also agree on the need to stand up to anti-Catholic bias to defend religious right. Do you see the dichotomy? Anyone who says anti-Catholic things are supposed to be defended by religious liberty. Do you see the, the problem that he is in? So obviously, if you are defending religious liberty, you are also supposed to, to defend someone who says something that is anti-Catholic, whether you like it or not. Because there is something that is called the First Amendment. First Amendment is that you can say actually whatever you want. And that's the beauty of the U.S. Constitution. And to create the culture that celebrates life. Well, we would agree with that, of course. America is in many ways divided. Applause. Thank you, America. America is in many ways divided like it's never been before. And the great religious leaders here tonight give us all an example that we can follow. We are living in a time, an age that we never thought possible before. The vicious barbarism we read about in history books, but never thought we would set, see in our so-called modern day world. Hmm. Is he talking about the Catholic Church? No. He's talking about ISIS. But what is it that we read in the history books? We see what the Catholics slaughtered Protestants. <clears throat> Who would have thought we would be witnessing what we are witnessing today? We have got to be very strong, very smart. And we've got to come together, not only as a nation, but as a world community. Thank you very much. God bless. God bless America. Fascinating, isn't it? Isn't that what Revelation 17 says? All the ten horns, all the ten kingdoms will give their power and authority to the beast for one hour so that the beast can dominate for one hour. World community. So Donald Trump, even if he has said that Americanism, not globalism, will be our credo, this is a globalist statement. Many people voted for Trump because he is a nationalist. But he wants to create the world community. He just said it now. An analysis, onward Christian cabinet, obviously now in a month, Trump is going to be inaugurated as the 45th or 46th, 45th president of the United States. 
and he's choosing his cabinet. He is choosing his cabinet. And interesting that I saw this article which said that Trump's White House picks are a Christmas gift for the religious right. So not only are the faith advisors giving their certain perspective of religion to him, but even the cabinet, the heads, the secretary of this state and the secretary of that head of department and this and that, are a Christmas gift to the religious right. Why? Because they all belong to this Christian right. Now, just because there is a Christian politician, obviously does not mean that you are going to go, go towards a certain direction. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that we are in this pendulum that is swinging back to the other side. Now, let us focus a bit on, Don, on Mike Pence. Mike Pence is considered to be a postmodern evangelical Catholic who is also a conservative. <laughs> let that sink in. It will not. <laughs> because for 40 years ago, the notion of a Catholic and an evangelical is going towards each other. But now, obviously, you can be whatever you want. And some people even say that Mike Pence, who is the vice president, he, is, he, he, he will be the most powerful Christian supremacist in U.S. history. Now, obviously, this article here, obviously, this article here is written by someone who is a la rather left liberal Democrat. So we need, to under we need to keep that in mind. But what is a Christian supremacist? Because I don't think we have an understanding of what a Christian supremacist is. There are white supremacists, and there may be black supremacists, but what is a Christian supremacist? Well, I found this article which says about Christian supremacy, that the ideology of Christian supremacism is commonly expressed in movements labeled Christian dominionism and Christian reconstructionism. We're going to come back to these terms soon. Now listen to this. Dominionists believe that God has given Christians the obligation to exercise dominion over the earth, especially America. So there is an authority from God himself to dominate. This means Christians must be in charge and enforce what kind of laws? Christian laws. Re Reconstructionists seeks to reconstruct America along Old Testament line, enforcing Old Testament laws in the civil sphere. Could a Sunday law be hanging in the air, in, uh, hanging in the cloud? Christian supremacism plays an influential role in America's Christian right. Once again, not everyone who is in the Christian right adheres to this political ideology. But there are many who adhere to it and are part of the Christian right. Now, they want to have government, to have biblical values. And of course, this is a Christian theocracy. Now, the enemy to them is what? Secularism. Do you know when we studied in the, this afternoon? Ecumenism is all about pushing out secularism. They want, God, they want a God-led government. That's the only legitimate government. And they want to have biblical capitalism. In other words, there are many spheres in the culture which needs to come under the control of God. The idea that this economic system is God-ordained. Put this on your mind. The economy is supposed to do, be what? It's supposed to be God-ordained. The authority is supposed to come from God. The rules and the values are supposed to come from God. You're going to see how shocking this actually is. Do we agree with it? Maybe. Depends on who, how you define God. And so if you are interested in this, obviously we will not go through the entire article. But if you're interested in this, like what is Christian dominionism? What is Christian reconstructionism? What is Christian um, supremacism and all of that? For instance, we would not be Christian supremacists. We would say that the values for our society would be the last six commandments. But we would not say that the foundation for, this, for, for society today would be the first four. 
because the first four only deals with God. The last six deal with humanity. What a Christian dominionist would do is they say that all the Ten Commandments are supposed to come on society, which means that you need to have legislation on the First Commandment, Second Commandment, Third Commandment, Fourth Commandment. If you do not worship on Sunday, what is going to happen to you? You are going to be punished. That's the political ideology behind it, and most of the Christian right are pushing this. And they are very close to Donald Trump. And it's a theocratic movement hiding in plain sight. Obviously, this article is once again a liberal perspective on it, but it gives you a fresh insight into what these people are actually saying. And so dominionists endorse theocratic visions in so far as they believe that the Ten Commandments or biblical law should be the foundation of American law and that the U.S. Constitution should be seen as a vehicle for implementing biblical principles. Do you see how a Sunday law could come about? You just have an enormous crisis or an enormous destruction, whether it is an earthquake, natural disaster, catastrophe in the economy. You have a terrorist attack and boom, you have a changed country and says, we, this has happened because we have rejected God. We have rejected God. We need to go back to God. If we have gone back to God, let us have our society built upon his law. You see how easy this could happen? It is because of his mercy that this has not yet happened. And when this Christian nation is in place, they say with the law in place, then they say Jesus will return. So they have a complete other perspective on the millennialism. Because we say that Jesus is going to come and then the millennia is going to start. They say, ah, oh, no, 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 no. We need to bring about the kingdom. We need to bring about the millennia. And then Jesus is going to come. You see? Mm. We, we, oh, I hope I put this, um, this quote from Ellen White, where she actually says that papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike, except the, um, she, she makes a statement and that they will, they will like to usher in um, the long-expected millennium. She actually makes that enormous statement. My question too, too is, how would that kingdom look like? How, do, how would that God, kingdom of God look like? And how would it be, how would it come about? Through love or force? <clears throat> Rick Joyner said, and he is also this Christian dominionist. Of course, Rick Joyner does not speak to everyone. But he says that at first it may seem like totalitarianism. It means that totalitarianism. Instead of taking away liberties and becoming more domineering, the kingdom will move from a point of necessary control while people are learning truth, integrity, love, and so on and so on. So we are going to be coercive and we are going to force you for a little bit. But then when it is over, it's a, it's, we have love, truth, and peace and all of that. He says, the kingdom will start out necessarily authoritative in many ways. But once we have purged away those dissenters, one, those heretics, which are now called extremists and fundamentalists and terrorists, when you have purged them away, we are going to have the kingdom of God. Is this the kingdom of God? No. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. George Washington said, look. A guy cannot be considered a patriot. He cannot be considered a patriotic American if he labors to subvert either Christianity or the Ten Commandments. The essence of what it means to be a patriot, according to George Washington, the definition of patriotism, the essence of patriotism, is a man who is a sincerely devoted follower of Jesus Christ and seeks to live his life by the Ten Commandments, who adheres to Christianity and to, the, and to the Ten Commandments. That is the definition and the mark and the hallmark of a patriot. And if somebody's laboring to subvert these things, you know, George Washington said, look, I'm not talking about perfect obedience here. I know nobody's going to do that. That's why we need a Savior. But if somebody is out there working to undermine, to subvert these things, to work against Christianity, 
to work against the public acceptance and the acknowledgement of the Ten Commandments. That guy is no patriot. He is a traitor to his country. And I have no hesitation in saying that today. You want to find a traitor to your country, find somebody who is actively working to oppose Christianity and oppose the public acknowledgement of the Ten Commandments. You are looking, my friend, right there at an American traitor. And so let, let me tell you this and then we can end. Thank you, Pastor. This is what we could call this ideology that they have is what we would call Seven Mountains Dominionism. I have started to research this, but I have also decided that, I, that there needs to be more academic papers on this because there is actually from... The atheistic side, there is some critique from it, but I don't see any critique from Christianity per se, from a biblical, biblical perspective. So I think we need to um, take more time on this. What they are saying is that culture can be divided into seven leading aspects. So how many aspects? Seven. Seven. And these seven are family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. All culture, if you want to dominate culture, you need to control and dominate each of these seven aspects of the culture. So we could take this picture, but I like this picture better. So they argue that family must undergird all culture mountains. Do we agree with that statement? I think we agree with that statement. It's a biblical statement, and the spirit of prophecy is making that statement. But you have to remember that they say that the church is on the top, and it is the values and the rules that comes from the church that is supposed to penetrate all the other aspects of culture. And it is only then when all the values from the church penetrating business is, what did Penn say? What did we read in the article? We should have what kind of capitalism? Biblical capitalism, which is God-ordained. Remember? Government, same thing. Church tells the government what laws to interpret and enforce. Also down into media, education, arts and entertainment, and also family. My question is, sounds beautiful, whose values are you letting to go out? Whose rules are you getting out? Pope Francis and Bernie Sanders want a what kind of economy? Moral economy you see friends where we are going no let us continue pope calls for a what kind of global economy god centered global economy when the catholic church says that it is a god centered economy they are not necessarily speaking about the bible per se but they are speaking about the teachings which the church interprets and then it becomes the god centered you see is this where we are headed? Pope calls for a global authority on economy. I wonder which global authority would that be? <laughs> the Catholic Church, of course. And we need to have regulation. And we need to have an authority to be regulated by law and would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice and respect for rights. You see where we are headed? The values and the rules going towards? What about family? Huh? What about family? What values do you want to have? Pope Francis says, Sundays are a gift from God. Don't ruin it. Sunday as it comes to family. Sunday as it comes to God. Do you see how the church should could once again become a powerful um, force? The last pope, previous pope, said Sundays must be a day of rest dedicated to God, family, pope says. And even in this article, the pope says 
when defending Sunday, one is defending human rest. My question is, if you do not defend Sunday, are you defending human freedom? Turning the question the other way around. Is this going to be the value and the rule that is going to make not only dominate the seven aspects of culture, but to get them and stick together? Just a couple of weeks ago, U.S. bishops back pillar of social rights call for recognition of Sunday rest. It is happening right before our very eyes. It is absolutely amazing. And let me come to the last quotes. And then we are done. There it was. There it was. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the formal godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement of the what? Conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. Do you think she was spot on? Yeah. She was spot on. Absolutely amazing. Christian right, they want to redefine religious liberty. They say crime, lawlessness, rejection of moral principles. Because of these, society is falling. Are we agree with them? Yes, we do. Question, how should this be solved? They say it can only be solved if we return to God. Do we agree with that? I think we do. But how? Correct. Are we supposed to force morality on people to save the nation? Is it wrong? The purpose is good, the approach is bad. Why is the approach bad? Because God has given us a conscience. God, and if I don't want to go along, if God is not forcing me to do His will, why should the government and the state do that? This pastor, Rob, Robert Grant, who is one of the main pillars of the Christian right movement, he said it was, if Christians unite, isn't that what Donald Trump said? If we just unite, we can do anything. We can pass any law or any amendment. And that's exactly what we intend to do. Do you see where a Trump presidency and a Trump administration could go? Just a couple of catastrophes in the world and people say we have abandoned God. You know, California and some of the cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, destroyed by earthquake, which Ellen White predicted it would happen before the Sunday law and all of these things happen. The, the, I, ha, I have the quotes. She says it, it, the judgments are with mercy. She says that the judgments of God are mercy. They are full of mercy. Which means that the seven last plagues are falling without mercy. And that's the end. That's the close of probation. But when the judgments are falling with mercy, the close of probation is still open. And that's going to be one of the ways, I believe, where people are going to say, you know what, we abandon God, let's go back to Him. Let us wrap up. Donald Trump vowed to close the gap between church and state. Do we see that? Mm. I believe we do. Are you excited? Yep. I'm excited. What we have preached for 130 years, it is happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited. This is not the time to hide. This is the time to stand up. Amen. This is the time to preach the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, letting people know that we have a relevant message for even this age. Prophecy is powerful. Don't let anyone say that powerful uh, prophecy is not powerful. Prophecy is powerful because God himself gave it. And Sunday, what do you think this unity is going to be united upon? Sunday as a mark of Christian unity. The, the foundation is being laid, and soon Sunday laws and all of these things that we have preached upon will happen. Let me read to you the last quote from Sister White, and, now, and then we are done. Heretofore, she says, those who presented the truth of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Many people have said it to me. Oh, conspiracy theory. What are you doing? Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States. The church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God. Have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been. The defender of religious freedom. But, <laughs> but... but 
as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and listen to this, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Amen. The third message would produce an effect which it could not have had before. We say, you know what? We've been preaching this 130 years. These events show Jesus is coming soon. Friends, let's go home. Let's go home. I want to go home. Don't you want to go home? I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus is going to return. When we're going to meet our... The dead in Christ will rise. Amen. And the people who, who went before us, we're going to meet them. Amen. But not only that, we will be with Jesus forever and ever. Oh, yes. I hope this day has been... Uh, inspirational to you. I hope this day has been a blessing to you because it has been a blessing to me. And as we are approaching the final events of Bible prophecy, may we not hide, but may we stand up and in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the love of Jesus Christ, may we preach the message with all power and tell people we are going home. Do you want to come with us? Amen. Let us pray.